Our special guest this week, Florida Agriculture Commissioner Adam Putnam. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me. Let's get right into the substance. Uh, Congress failed to pass a farm bill again. What's the significance of the bill and what can be done to get it fixed? You know, the significance of U.S. farm policy is that uh, it includes uh, not only support for food security in this country, having an abundant, safe, affordable supply of food so that we're not as dependent on other countries for our food as we are for our fuel, but it also includes things important to, uh, to non-grain states like Florida. You know, the bulk of the farm bill that's agricultural related goes to the grains, corn, wheat, soybeans, cotton. The things in there that matter to Florida, research, marketing, and most importantly, pest and disease uh, detection and eradication. So whether it's citrus greening or giant African land snails or any of the dozens of issues that, that face Florida, that's really where we get the support to eradicate these things that threaten a $100 billion ag industry in our state. How will Congress get it back on track and what can you do to push them to do that? Well, you know, our uh, congressional delegation has, uh, has some great leadership in it uh, on, on the ag issues. Uh, they're going to all have to regroup and figure out how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You know, they've got a bill out of the Senate. The House continues to struggle with that urban-rural balance between the, the food stamp coalition and the more rural, pure agricultural program-oriented folks. But uh, there's a lot of money in there, a lot of programs in there that support the Florida Everglades, the Northern Everglades, the Spring Sheds, Lake Okeechobee, as well as research and marketing. So I'm hopeful that they will be able to get it back on track and, and strike the right balance. Well, recently you called water policy the number one issue in Florida. Can you explain why? Well, whether you want to plant an orange grove, build a subdivision, or save the Everglades, water is going to drive economic development and quality of life decisions in this state. From the springs of the, the Big Bend area to Apalachicola Bay, which is not an urban area, but nevertheless is suffering the most right now from an absence of water supply that's killing Apalachicola Bay, which is then killing jobs in those communities to the issues surrounding Lake Okeechobee, which uh, the environment and six million people depend on. So long term, it's important for us to have a policy that is uh, forward thinking on both water quality and water quantity. And what about our difficulty in working with other states? We're downstream from several other states whose water policies affect ours. Well, and that's really the challenge in Apalachicola. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, which is a federal agency, is not allowing adequate volumes of water to come down the Apalachicola River from Georgia. Atlanta is essentially hogging that water. And, uh, and we need to very aggressively, whether it's in court, uh, in the regulatory realm, or in the congressional realm, assert our rights as a state because we are seeing real environmental harm and now real economic harm as a result of their decision to bias that water flow toward Georgia and away from Florida. Everyone's concerned about childhood obesity in Florida and nationally. You were concerned enough to take control of the school lunch program at the Department of Agriculture. Why and what's the experience? Well, thanks to the Florida legislature's leadership, we became the first state in the country for the legislature to move responsibility for the school feeding programs to the Department of Agriculture. The Department of Education had done a good job, but you know, with all the other issues on their plate, graduation rates and raising test scores and getting kids college and career ready, school lunches was never going to be a big priority. It is a huge priority for us. I view nutrition uh, issues as a major um, priority for the Department of Agriculture in the 21st century. We live in a state that grows 300 different things, all of which your mother would be proud for you to eat, and we grow them at a time of year that kids are in school. So, you know, you can talk about uh, upstate Michigan's uh, raspberries or the, the most wonderful apples from upstate New York, but the bottom line is in January and February, and for most of the school year, the things that are fresh and in season and healthy are coming out of Florida. And so we view it as a way to, uh, to, come to, to, to have a, a, a healthier generation of Floridians, uh, support locally grown products, and, uh, and bend the healthcare cost curve because 60% uh, of our healthcare costs are managing diet-related illnesses. So briefly, are there now healthier choices on the cafeteria menus in our schools? We are now seeing healthier options that are locally grown. This is not the old um, 
tater tots and ketchup on a plate that's being called a starch and a vegetable. We're giving kids options, citrus, and berries, and fresh vegetables, and corn. We're saving money, putting that, those savings back into the quality of the menu, and giving kids options. This is not the Michael Bloomberg approach. You announced uh, plans to run for re-election to a second term in 2014, but did it with very little fanfare. Why so low-key? Well, I, I'm not being so quiet about it now. We, uh, we filed paperwork toward the end of the legislative session when we were focused on the business at hand. But in order to have a very public kickoff, you have to file papers and get everything squared away so that you're legal and you have, there's a certain order to do those things. But, you know, I'm excited about uh, getting around the state and asking people to, uh, to renew my contract for another four years. Okay. Well, good luck, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Florida Newsmakers.